Hi, welcome to Hillcrest Sermons, Growing Together. Show us your heart's delight. Cool. Well, good morning. My name's Tim, and uh, looks like we're having a little bit of technical problem. That is uh, a norm. That happens. Um, if you've ever worked with technology in any place in your life. So um, they'll be, I'm sure they'll be working the kinks out on that. I want to say welcome to this uh, second Sunday of Advent. It's good to be together, Hans. Uh, oh, there you are, Hans. Thanks. It's good to good to see you, and uh, always great to hear about, um, yeah, what's going on in the mission. So appreciate you. Before I get into this morning's message, um, you know, I want to uh, just kind of do one more announcement. Um, some of you might have seen this. Uh, I sent out an email this week, but. One of the things when I was um, asked to serve as lead pastor, one of the things that uh, I would just say I recognize, those around me recognize, the council, the team recognizes that we would also need someone with a strong set of uh, organizational administrative skills um, to join the team. That was, that was just a, a kind of a missing ingredient, somebody with that skill set uh, to help oversee just a lot of the operation, you know, facilities, finance, comms. Um, these things, but also with the pastor's heart to do pastoral leadership development here at Hillcrest. And so we've been looking for an executive pastor and having conversations with council and the staff. Um, and it's my pleasure to announce that we have extended this opportunity to James Jr. Um, he has said yes. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, James has served on the college ministry uh, for about 20 years uh, and just a wonderful ministry over there. We've been in, and this isn't a surprise to them, we've been in conversation with them and there's this common agreement uh, between Hillcrest and the college ministry that this is a good step uh, for James and a good step uh, for Hillcrest Church. Um, he's not officially starting yet. Actually, what we're going to do is next Sunday, the 17th, we're going to have Cozy Christmas. And so Cozy Christmas slash get to say hi to James and Janelle. Um, so after both services, they'll be around just for some meet and greet time next week. Uh, and then he's going to begin in uh, January here at Hillcrest while also kind of passing on some responsibilities over at the college ministry. And so uh, I'm excited. Uh, you know, this has been... Uh, you know, people have said, hey, Tim, what's it like uh, being in that lead role? And I've been, and I've said, I don't totally know yet. Because uh, a lot of it, you know, uh, I've been covering a lot of different things that I'm not going to be covering a year from now. And so um, I'm excited for the, the gifts, James, that you bring to the team. I believe that uh, this is a gift from God. Um, and I'm just grateful um, that you have said yes to this. So I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I want to, uh, today's the second Sunday of Advent, and I want to move into this morning's message, but let me just start, let me just pause and say a prayer for us and kind of ready our hearts uh, to go into the Word together. Mm. Father, Son, Spirit, mm. Lord, uh, we come here before you and we bring, uh, we bring the joys of the week, we bring the grief of the week. We bring the decisions, the busyness of the week. And God, you see, you see us. You see straight to the center of our hearts. And you know those things that kind of on the surface we want. And you also see the deep, deep desires of our heart. Uh, and ultimately the deepest desire, uh, which is for you, uh, the one who is truly good. And so even this morning, Lord, as we, as we talk about um, Scripture, as we talk about um, the way that... Uh, your followers have made songs out of, of your truth. Uh, may it ultimately lead to meeting you. Not just ideas about you, Lord, but an encounter with you in and of yourself. Pray this in your name. Amen. Well, um, December 11th, 1792, Salzburg, Austria. There is a woman, uh, uh, this is Salzburg, this is not 1792, um, I couldn't find a picture from that year. Um, there's a woman, Anna, um, uh, uh, single, unwed, um, she had fallen in love with a mercenary soldier, uh, become pregnant, and then he had abandoned her. She was poor, she was a seamstress, um, and on December 11th, she had this baby boy. 
and named him Joseph uh, after his godfather. And so Anna and Joseph, um, they lived a very uh, poor life in Salzburg. Um, and the church they're a part of, the, like the minister of music, saw Joseph and began to take Joseph under his wing. One of the things the minister of music did is try to provide Joseph with an education. And so provided Joseph with an education. And eventually, as Joseph um, uh, was kind of growing up and beginning to leave the home, he decided he wanted to go into ministry. And so he went into seminary. It was a Catholic church. Went into seminary and then became a priest in the area. And, and when he was uh, about 26 years old, he was an assistant priest of a small village called Oberndorf. He's 26 years old, assistant priest, and it's, uh, it's Christmas Eve in 1818. Joseph is this assistant priest, and uh, he's, uh, he wants to, they have this midnight mass, so like midnight Christmas to celebrate the birth of Jesus, and he wants to present, he wants to play a new special piece of music, and he's trying to, I, yeah, like, I want to present something new and beautiful, um, and it's just a few hours before the service, and so he had uh, developed a friendship with a local music teacher, Franz Gruber. Not Hans Gruber, that's a different Christmas story. <laughs> Franz Gruber. And so he, uh, he goes to Franz's house, and, uh, and he, says, he says, Franz, I, it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's snow. He walks a mile and a half. He gets there, and he's like, I want, I want to present this, this piece of music. And two years earlier, Joseph had written a poem about the birth of Jesus. He says, I've got these lyrics. I need music. So over the next couple hours, Franz wrote the music to go with the poetry that Joseph had written. So on, uh, on Christmas, uh, December 25th, 1818, at the age of 26, Joseph, at midnight, presents this song, played to his favorite instrument, the acoustic guitar, and it was called Still Not, or Silent Night. It was the first time that the song Silent Night had ever been played in the world. So time goes on. <clears throat> Joseph continues serving as a priest. He gets moved to other village parishes. Um, the song uh, kind of begins to spread by word of mouth, and there's a couple uh, family troops of singers that traveled around Europe that heard about it. And they began traveling around Europe playing Still Not, Silent Night. In fact, it gets, it gets played before royalty, like the royalty of Austria and Prussia and Russia, and becomes quite popular. And in the meantime, Joseph is just serving in obscurity um, as a parish priest. He, he's quite a generous man. He gives most of his salary to charity. Um, in fact, he's working at one point uh, to set up a school for children who couldn't afford education uh, so that they could go to school, which is so interesting, out of his own life story, setting up uh, systems of care for the elderly of the parishes that he serves in. Um, in 1839, Joseph is doing this, this parish ministry. In 1839, the song has already made it to the U.S. and is being played over in the United States. And Joseph is continuing his ministry in obscurity. And at the age of 55, in 1848, uh, Joseph passes away. Uh, the decades pass and people forget that he ever wrote the song at all. By the, uh, by the 1900s, some people thought the song was written by Mozart or Beethoven. They didn't know where it had come from. And in 1995, this manuscript was discovered in Joseph's handwriting, one of the original ones uh, that talks about when he uh, first wrote the words in 1816, two years before he, that night with Franz and the first playing of Silent Night. Joseph Moore the author of Silent Night. What makes a beautiful life? Is it possessions or fame? Think about Joseph in this work in obscurity, this, this beautiful piece of art that he left in the world that touched so many lives, spending years of his life working among those in need in his immediate community, and never getting wealthy off of it, never even being known for it in his living years. What makes a beautiful life? And even what shapes a beautiful life? I, I, you know, I don't, we don't have Joseph's journals, or we don't know, you know, what, kind of what uh, his thinking. All we have is the song and the lyrics of this song, Silent Night. And one of the things, as I've spent time with the song, one of the things I've noticed is how much the song Silent Night isn't about doing anything. 
There's no imperatives. There's no commands. There's no, no, there's no change the world. There's no, like, try hard to be good. The whole song is simply transporting the singers into an encounter to be present at the moment that God entered human history. It's a, just a declaration of a reality to be wondered at. And I believe, if you, if, from the, what we know of Joseph's life, it is the reality that his life orbited around. This young man, his life could have gone so many different directions, but he leaves this piece of beauty. He, he serves in so many ways. I believe this is the thing his life orbited around, the fact of the Son of God entering human history as a baby child. And then even for me, it just raises, what does my life orbit around? What is the center of gravity of my life? And I think this story for Joseph Moore, this man, it orbited around uh, this God of love who stepped into human history. I want to look at the words of Silent Night with you. I want to look at some of the scriptures behind them. And I, and I hope this morning, I want to, I want to honor kind of that, that ethos. I don't, want to, I don't want to put another thing on your to-do list uh, during this Advent season. But I, I hope that we might uh, spiritually, internally be able to encounter again this God who chose to step into human history uh, as Jesus of Nazareth. So let's, let's look at these words uh, together. Um, verse 1, silent night, you might have heard it. Um, silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. Round yon virgin, mother and child, holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace. And this, the, these words, of course, um, they're, they're mainly uh, relaying to us what is captured in the ancient biography of Jesus called Luke. And so let me just read this part of Luke uh, that this, uh, this first verse of Silent Night is based off of. So Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says, while they, that is Joseph and Mary, were in Bethlehem, while they were there in Bethlehem, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And so even, even in the, the Gospel of Luke's words, like it, it is, it's just, it's very ordinary. It's just, it's, it's the description of this young woman having her firstborn son while in Bethlehem, while with Joseph. And in uh, and, and this first verse of Silent Night, I think if anything, it captures the ordinariness of it. I mean, there, you know, there's not a lot of like theological words. Let's go back to the lyrics of the song. There's not a lot of theological words in there. It's just about this young mother and this newborn baby resting together. And, and there's, two ways, uh, there's two ways to sing this, and I want to be clear, I think the emphasis is on the ordinary, because we could sing this part, and you could get the confusing idea of like super baby, like Jesus never cried. It was just silent all the time, and Mary never had bags under her eyes, and it was just always, there weren't even dirty diapers, or maybe like at six months of age, Jesus was changing those diapers, or like, no, it's not, that is not what is intended to be conveyed. Like, the, what is intended to be conveyed is the, the ordinariness of God's entry into the world. The, it's this moment of calm, it's this moment of calm as this exhausted mother and this tired newborn fall asleep after the work of bringing him into the world. And these, this is just, it's just an ordinary human moment. And the peace of that, I think about, I can't help but think about the birth of my first child. Um, do we have that? Did that picture end up making it to proclaim? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the birth of my first child. And after being up all night and then getting moved to this like recovery room and Christy sleeping in the bed and her all bundled up asleep and me with nothing but a plastic chair uh, to sit in. And but they're just, they were sleeping in heavenly peace. And it's, but this first thought, we're transported to the ordinary birth of this child, Jesus of Nazareth. With, with hints of more, it mentions the mother being a virgin. It mentions him as a holy child. But the emphasis is on the ordinariness, a God who shows up in the ordinariness of a human child. Verse 1. Verse 2, we're actually moved 
um, from this, uh, this room where uh, Mary and Jesus are and were moved out into the shepherd fields nearby. In verse 2, we, we, kind of, uh, we encounter the angels along with the shepherds. And so um, the, words, uh, the words of the song are, Silent night, holy night, shepherds quake at the sight. Glory stream from heaven afar, heavenly hosts sing alleluia. Christ the Savior is born. And this, too, again, follows uh, the, the ancient biography of Jesus called Luke. It follows along because it mentions that there are these shepherds in fields nearby, these just blue-collar workers, and that God chose to first announce the birth of his son into the world to these shepherds. In Luke, uh, in Luke 2, um, jumping ahead to like verse 10, it describes these shepherds, and it says, But the angel said to them, these shepherds, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And again, it's this moment of encounter. And now, you know, we, we've encountered this, this ordinary child. And now we see that this child, there's something about this child that's going to be more than just ordinary. That God is doing something in human history. And, and with the shepherds, we, we encounter this moment. And I just want to notice again, in this, this description of the announcement to the shepherds, there's nothing that we're told to do. There's nothing like go, go follow these rules or go do this thing. It's just God has done this. Come and see. Stand and wonder. Be silent before it. And so verse 1, the ordinariness. Verse 2, uh, hearing the announcement um, with the shepherds. And then verse 3. And it's like in verse 3, uh, if verse 1 is the ordinariness of this child, in verse 3, it's like the, the veil is pulled back, the curtain is pulled back, and the full reality of who this baby is, who his identity is, is announced, that we sing it out. The, the words say, silent night, holy night, son of God, loves pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face. With the dawn of redeeming grace, Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. And it, and it just goes through. It's, just, it's kind of layering these identities of who this ordinary child is, a son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Love's pure light that through this Jesus, God's love is poured out into the world. Radiant beams from thy holy face. Once again, not super baby, not actually glowing baby. This is, we talked about this last week, that Jesus is the light in the darkness, that he brings God's goodness and justice to bear into the, in a world marred by sin and death and evil. Like he is God's light shining into the world, the dawn of redeeming grace. This is, this is, this is the, the, uh, the full uh, theological reality of who this child is. It goes along with things... Um, one of the other Gospels, one of the other biographies of Jesus called the Book of John, talks about Jesus coming into the world um, this way, about his full identity. In John 1.14, um, we read, The Word, that is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Word became flesh, became a human being, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And there is just, uh, if in verse 1 we're asked to uh, stand in silence at the ordinariness of the birth of Jesus, in verse 3 we stand in silence at the mystery and the wonder of the birth of Jesus. Because what is, what is being declared here? I mean, the Son of God, the one, the power that made the cosmos, the power that upholds the cosmos, the, the one who, who, the, who is good, capital G, that all goodness rests upon, this one has somehow been restricted down, limited down, squeezed down into a seven-pound human infant lying in a stone manger. And in, in every sense that, that the Son of God is not 
God is not in, uh, in Jesus. God is not there like doing quantum mechanic formulas in the back of his head while he's you know, waiting for Mary to pick him up. Like somehow in, in the, into, like God became fully human in all the limitedness of a human infant. And how does God do that? Like this is a mystery we stand in wonder at. And it ultimately it points ahead to the cross and the resurrection. But, but sometimes we talk about that Jesus rescues us at the cross and the resurrection. And that is true. But it is here in this moment. God has bound himself to humanity. God has intertwined himself through humanity. God's fate and the fate of humankind are now bound up together. And God says, I will be with you. I have come to heal and rescue I do not stand at a distance. I am the God who is with you all the way down to birth and ultimately all the way down to the grave. God says, I am with you. His rescue begins here. And we stand in silent wonder. We're not asked to do something. We're asked to stand in silence. There's that verse that, uh, that Justin read of our scripture. And it's from this ancient Israelite prophet, Habakkuk. And the verse says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And I think the book of Luke and the song Silent Night says something maybe even more wonderful. The Lord is in his holy manger. Let all the earth be silent before him. That silence is the appropriate response to the holy mystery of the God of the universe being born a human child to step into a world marred by death, by evil and injustice, a God who does not stand aloof at a distance, but a God says, I will come and be with you to heal and to rescue and to bring light and to bring life. And I think the, the book of Luke and I think the song Silent Night brings us to that moment that we could respond in silent wonder. Because ulti- I mean, ultimately, the heart, the heart of the Jesus movement, the heart of Christianity, the beginning place, is not, it's not a list of rules. It's not things to do. It's not make sure you get to, you know, 45 Sundays out of the year and you got to read the Bible this way. It's, that's not the heart of Christianity. At its heart is a, is a reality, is a fact, is a God who stepped into human history. It's a person who has done something. And the heart of the Christian movement is to trust and to succumb and just to encounter the Holy One who has come into human history. And this song, and I think these scriptures, they usher us into a place of encounter. Yes, there there are ways that our life will be changed by that. Our life will begin to orbit around this one that we encounter. But the starting point is to encounter this Jesus and to stand in silent wonder. You could say worshiping silence. I think this is what happened to Joseph. I think his life, I think he encountered this Jesus. I think his life was touched by it. I think his life orbited around this God who stepped into human history. I think so many have met this Jesus and had their lives orbit around him. Joseph, he wrote that song, as I said, he wrote it in 1816, the first performed it in 1818. 96 years later was the year 1914. And Europe was wracked uh, in the First World War. And... Um, you know, it's this, if you've read books about it or seen movies, um, the First World War was just this war of trench warfare. It was just awful. Um, these, these muddy trenches and this barren ground, just this hellscape of barbed wire. And these soldiers living in these trenches, just mud and rats and lice and cold. And in the winter of 1914, um, some of the fighting was kind of along the lines between uh, France and Belgium. And uh, they came to Christmas Eve... 1914, five or six months into this first 
uh, World War, and there was a German line, a British, made by, uh, many, many by Scottish regiments, and then a, a French line there. And on the Christmas Eve of uh, 1914, some of the Germans had got a hold of uh, evergreen trees and put candles on them and actually put them up on top of the trenches for the other uh, opposing soldiers to see. And uh, this is from Silent Night, the story of the World War I Christmas truce. Um, this is from Albert Morin of the 2nd Queen's Regiment. It says, he remembered many years later that performance that began just after dark. It was a beautiful moonlit night, frost on the ground, white almost everywhere. And there was a lot of commotion in the German trenches, and then there were those lights. I still don't know what they were. And then they sang, Silent Night, Still Knocked. I shall never forget it. It was one of the highlights of my life. And in this place of death, a moment of peace broke in as these opposing soldiers together stood in wonder again at the birth of this child. The Christmas truce of 1914. This uh, was uh, memorialized in a movie a few years ago. The movie Jaillou Noel. Uh, it was a foreign film, but it captures this moment that was, uh, that was this uh, Albert just talked about when Silent Night uh, was sung and truce broke out. And so I want us to end the message this morning by watching this movie clip. So let's see if we can get this to work. Thanks for listening. For more info, visit hcbellingham.com and join us any Sunday, 9 and 11 a.m.